James, when I was a kid and I first got into recording, I got some egg boxes and stuff, and then a lot of people have come along with all sorts of ideas. You were one of the first into the market with building a reflection filter. It seems that every man and his dog's got one now from a piece of phone that's just wrapped a bit. Yours seems to be pretty serious and one of the most expensive ones on the market. Why is that? Um, okay, well, first of all, we were the first onto the market. Um, it's something which we've got a patent pending on. Um, we brought out the reflection filter a little over four years ago, and um, it's one of my it's one of my pet bugbears um, because getting it right was extremely difficult. We actually the original brief for the reflection filter was that we wanted to try and create a portable vocal booth, and believe it or not, when we were, in the early days when we were trying to think of ways of doing this, we were thinking about pop up tents and you know thing you know panels that you could put together, all sorts of stuff because. The biggest problem with creating something which is an effective acoustic absorber is that you, you need mass and you need something fairly large to do that. And to create something which is at all effective in a small space is really, really difficult. We brought the reflection filter market to market. It took us about two years to develop the product from when we had the original concept idea. About six months into it, we hit on the idea of having some kind of you know, screen um, and that, it had never been done before. So when you look back on it now, it seems like a perfectly obvious idea. Um, and people had done things like put pillows behind microphones and whatever, but all, all of those solutions have fundamental problems. Um, and that is that if you only absorb uh, one band of frequencies, you'll start to color the microphone. You have to try and absorb or let, or let audio pass through or reflect it, a, ser you know, a combination of things, as, as evenly as you possibly can. An acoustic device should not have a sound. And it's a, it's a mistake that even some professionals make sometimes when you hear them talking about these devices that other people have brought out and they say they like the sound of it. Um, you shouldn't hear what an acoustic device is doing in terms of tonal quality. You should only hear the effect it has in terms of how easy it is to then put those tracks into a mix in a way that's manageable. And I think people have difficulty getting their head around that. They like pieces of kit to actually feel like they're doing something tangible. The reason that the reflection filter works and why it took so long to develop is because we've, we are in the process of gaining the patent of multi-layer technology, something which we applied for about four and a half years ago. And that allows you to condense down into a much smaller space what you would do with one block of a large material by using lots of different layers of materials, tensioned differently, different... Um, absorption or, ref or reflection properties, you can create something in a small, small space which has uh, a range of properties ar uh, across a, a range of frequencies. So can you share us that in bits, how, how one of these comes to bits? Yeah, um, basically you, uh, these, these are the various components or, uh, in sort of pre-fabrication stage for the reflection filter. And you start off with a layer of punched aluminium and then on the inside of that, you can just about see if I, I pull this apart, there is a layer of uh, acoustic grade wool. And then you have a layer of aluminium foil. And that's not the kind of stuff that you'd put a chicken in in the oven. It's, it's very high grade aluminium foil with the strengthening ribs in it that you can tension. And you then have the inside element of the reflection filter, which is this. It's a, uh, the, the main body, the main frame of it has these rods which separate out an air gap and a, an air barrier is a, a very, uh, a very um, efficient acoustic barrier. Um, it's very good at stopping sound going through it. Uh, you then have another layer of uh, acoustic grade wool. You then have a layer of punched plastic on the back panel, on the, sorry, the inside of the front panel. And then on the inside of all of that, you have these, you have another layer of uh, air gaps and then these polyester acoustic fiber board. This is a patented material that we buy in from a company that uh, makes these things for us in India. It's very high density, it's uh, much higher density than foam, and so it's got uh, very good absorption properties for something which is in a, in a small space. And we have four of these panels on the inside body of the main reflection filter. So you have a number of different layers in there all working together. Now, if you, if you do what <laughs> a lot of the competitors out there have done, um, and that's trying to strip that down and simplify it into what looks like a copy of a reflection filter, it simply doesn't work. So that's why the reflection filter is such a complex product that works and why it's so expensive because there's lots of different materials in there um, and there's a lot of build time goes into making the product. Now, 
for about the first year after we brought the reflection filter out, everybody kind of sat back and waited to see what would happen. And we, we created a huge market. Um, we sold tens of thousands of them in the first year. To date, we've sold just a little under 200,000 reflection filters worldwide. It has become an industry standard. It's very, not very often you can say that. And it's another one of the many patents that SE holds. But what we saw after about the first year was one by one other, mainly OEM companies, um, coming onto the market with what people perceive to be copies. Actually, they're not copies in so much as they, they don't at all perform the function that they should do as an acoustic uh, absorber, diffuser. Most of these cheap copies are built on a base of foam. So they're, they're, uh, nearly all of them are either just plain foam on a stick or foam backed onto some kind of perforated metal or plastic backing. Or in some cases, in the worst cases, they are foam on a, a hard reflective backing. And that's the, if you try to go out of your way to design the worst possible acoustic device you could to deliberately screw up your recordings, that's exactly what you design. The reason behind that is that foam only works at basically high frequencies. It does, especially a thin layer of foam, does virtually nothing below 2K. All of the problems that you get in a project si studio size room happen between about 50 hertz and 500 hertz. So first of all, that foam shield is doing absolutely nothing to correct the real problems in the room. What it does do is it rolls off high frequency so that when you're listening back to tracks, you think, oh, that sounds dark and therefore it sounds acoustically treated. To the untrained ear, that's, that sounds like a good thing. It seems to be what you're trying to achieve and it absolutely isn't. Because if you track something with a piece of foam and then you're rolling off the top end frequencies, when you come to put those tracks back into a mix, you find that they sound slightly dull, that there's some life missing in the top end. So you, the tendency is to want to EQ that life back into it. But of course, you've removed that audio signal. So what you're EQing back in now is uh, noise. You're increasing the noise floor. So that's not a great start. Um, it, does, uh, it does limit to some degree the amount of, ref uh, the amount of um, reflective sound that you hear in the room but it also damages the track in terms of its clarity, if you like, the top end frequencies. Um, if you then go that next step on and you put that foam onto a hard reflective backing and you make the surface that it's on semicircular, concave, and you put a mic in front of it, then the reflective backing reflects all of the problem frequencies which the foam isn't dealing with and then concentrates them back onto the capsule of the microphone. So what you end up with is a lack of high frequency and even worse low and mid frequencies than you had before you started and your whole mix does that or your, all of your tracks do that. It is just the worst possible thing that you can do and I've heard professional people talking about products like that where they've said um, I love the sound that this gives me in my studio. That's it may well be that they've used it on a certain thing, just like I was talking about mics earlier, and you might have a, a very, very poor quality mic that works in a specific application. But that's not what an acoustic product is for. If you're lucky enough to use it in a certain way on a certain track and it give you a sound, great, brilliant, well done. But what you want with an acoustic product, what the reflection filter is for, is to control the environment that you're recording in, to be able to use in all situations so that your tracking is manageable and your mixes are much easier to do. The reason that the reflection filter is used by nearly all of the 300 indoor C's that work with us across the world is because it works. If you can show me another one of these copies <laughs> that, has, that has that kind of exposure in the pro studios, I'd be happy to have a look at it. But you know, the, the pro studios don't use these cheaper ones because of the, the build problems with them and the fact that they just don't work.